All right, Forbidden Topics uh, is the main title. Lessons that'll get you criticized, called out, or canceled. And we are on number 12. Uh, uh, this is the second part of what we started last week, Genetic Engineering, Playing God Part Two. We had Playing God Part One last week, this week Playing God Part Two. Last week, we had a lesson on genetic engineering and I said this was a scientific method of describing and manipulating the genetic codes or the blueprints for inanimate as well as living things. For example, genetic modification uh, was a procedure where vegetables, for example, were modified to produce uh, a more resistant or a higher yield type. Very good use of that science, very good use of that approach. Uh, then there's creation of new life forms. Uh, this went far beyond uh, this type of uh, you know, research and it included the manipulation of the codes in animals and humans to alter life or to produce it. And this is what has caused, of course, uh, ethical and moral problems. So last week we discussed uh, human engineering and how it was practiced at four points in the life cycle, very briefly. We said uh, it was practiced before conception uh, through either contraception or sterilization or genetic screening. I'm not going to go back and do all that over again tonight, but we said that genetic screening, although very you know, difficult and problematic uh, procedure, is okay as long as it doesn't include abortion as an option. It's great to have your baby screen, screened while in the womb and said, oh, look, you know, there might be this, there might be that we might be able to have some you know, prenatal surgery you know, to fix this before the baby's out, that's fine. Sometimes, however, the uh, suggestion is, well, you know, the baby's deformed, you really don't want a handicapped child, why don't we get an abortion in here early and uh, save everyone a lot of grief and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, as was said last week, that is uh, unacceptable, um, unbiblical. Then uh, we talked about um, human engineering at conception, uh, artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization, talked about that again. Okay, as long as the one flesh principle is respected and no embryos are intentionally killed, talked about that. And then gene editing, the newest research. Um, and of course, with gene editing, you have the possibility of producing designer babies with gene editing. I want blue eyes, I want blonde hair, I want whatever, a tall, this, that, whatever. Uh, so we have now the dawning of the time when we can produce babies a la carte and then there's the, uh, the science and the procedure of cloning, which we're going to talk about uh, tonight. Uh, so there's at human engineering before conception, at conception, and then prenatal and postnatal. And if time permits, I'll talk about that as well. Now the point made about all these issues was that as Christians, we need to understand what is being done and the arguments in defense of these things so that we can render an answer, which is both intelligent, you know, that we actually understand the issue, and at the same time, biblical, so that we know what is right from wrong according to scripture, because scripture's teaching can be applied to these things. Now, we, they're never applied to these things if we watch TV or read science magazines or whatever, uh, but hopefully from the church, we get some uh, teaching on this. Uh, let's see, so let's talk about human engineering uh, as far as cloning is concerned. English word clone comes from a Greek word, clone, which means to sprout 
or a sprout or a twig, basically refers to the asexual process of reproduction. For many of, uh, of uh, life's forms, uh, cloning, the asexual reproduction that results in the exact genetic duplicate of the original. This is both natural and harmless. There are some species that you know, do this. For example, when the blob-like amoeba reproduces by uh, splitting into two parts, it is essentially cloning itself. Fine, it's part of the creation. Uh, cloning then is, is a way of growing many identical cells or organisms from a single ancestor. Again, it's part of nature. For a time, the only cloning possible was with plants. And then in 1952, doctors Briggs and King of the Cancer Research Institute in Philadelphia cloned a leopard frog, not a leopard, a leopard frog, which still was quite a feat at that time. As late as 1979, researchers were being quoted in journals that it was not possible to clone mammals. Okay, a frog, that's fine, but mammals, no way, that'll never happen. We can't do it, it's too complicated. However, almost 20 years later, Dr. Ian Wilmot and other scientists at the Roslyn Institute in Scotland succeeded in cloning a female sheep, a new, the first mammal ever successfully cloned. It was all quite exciting. I remember in the news and lots of documentaries about that. The procedure, as best as I can explain it in a simple manner, in the simplest of terms, this is what, this is what they did. Step number one. Step number one is he took a cell from the udder of one ewe and placed it in a solution which deactivated its growth mechanisms. This means he kept the cell alive, but made it dormant so it would not reproduce. Step number two, he took an egg cell from another ewe and removed its nucleus, including its DNA. So what he had was one cell with its code intact, but in neutral. And he had another cell that was emptied of its code, but still had all the mechanisms left to power the growth and development uh, of a code. With me so far? Step number three. The following step was to fuse these together. And he did this by placing these two cells next to each other and passing a current of electricity through them in order to get them to merge, and they did. Now, what was so new was not so much the fusing of nuclei. What was discovered was that an adult cell could revert to its embryonic stage and fire up all of its original codes in order to reproduce itself. That was the big uh, discovery. Step number five, and six, the last stage was to implant that fused cell, the code cell and the receiver cell fused together, to plant that in a third animal for a gestation period. So when the animal was born, anybody remember the name of that animal? Dolly, Dolly. hello Dolly, yes Dolly. It was the exact duplicate of its mother only. It was a duplicate of its mother only. Only the female had provided its code, fired up in a receiver cell, carried by a third animal, producing one animal from the other. Now, in normal reproduction, the fusing of the male with the female codes produced a spring which showed traits, uh, offspring rather, which showed traits of both the male and the female. In cloning, however, an artificial method of firing up a code is done 
And what is produced is an exact duplicate of the donor of the code. One of the parents is reproduced, but not a combination of both parents. That's what cloning is. So we have the, the good and the bad of cloning. Like any scientific discovery, this process can be used in a variety of ways, either for good or evil. Unfortunately, the stakes are much higher with cloning because what we are experimenting with here are the basic building blocks of life itself. Not just the ability to go fast or produce some kind of better plastic. When it comes to cloning animals, there seems to be agreement that a method that can produce a better type of animal, more resistant to disease, for example, or yielding a higher rate of food or milk or other products, most agree this is a benefit to mankind and not in violation of scripture. As a matter of fact, Genesis 1 verse 28 says that man was to be fruitful, to multiply, replenish the earth, to subdue it. And so, uh, you know, with the uh, increasing population of the world, these types of breakthroughs in producing better and more profitable plants and animals, this is in line with God's command to subdue the creation, be wise stewards of our resources, get more out of you know, uh, a wheat plant than had, you know, it had been producing previously through scientific assistance. Nothing wrong there. The problem occurs when we enter the area of eugenics. Eugenics, the process of developing a better race of humans through selection and genetic engineering. That's where the problem comes in. The possibility of doing with human beings what we have done with animals, you know, cloning a genetic double of only one person without the normal sexual act to produce conception. That's what's upon us. The possibility of that being a normal thing. So the possibilities of eugenics are incredible, but also very frightening. For example, cloning to provide children to infertile couples or unmarried people. Homosexuals are especially eager for this, to be able to clone one or the other partner. Uh, cloning to provide body parts for future use, like a body parts farm. You know, this is the brave new world that this type of eugenics uh, can bring us to. Or cloning to produce a super race where only the brightest and the best are reproduced and those who don't make the grade are not allowed. Uh, this is a, a method using science, if you wish, to arrive at what was crudely tried uh, you know, uh, 50, uh, 100 years ago with the you know, uh, World War II uh, and the uh, Germans trying to eradicate uh, you know, uh, Jews and uh, other uh, you know, races that they didn't feel <laughs> were worthy of being on the gypsies and, and others, you know, uh, were simply eliminated. They were killed. That was the crude way of you know, building the master race. Let's just kill everything that's not, that doesn't live up to, you know, uh, abortion was used for this. Um, now uh, we don't have to use these crude methods, you know, uh, ovens and firing squads, and we don't have to do that anymore. We have the science now that can achieve these types of, of goals. The evolutionary nightmare where the false theory of evolution becomes social policy driven by human engineering, <laughs> watch out, watch out. Cloning to produce a private workforce, slaves. Cloning to produce an army. And we say, oh, that's, that's in the comic books. Well, yeah. 
So what does the Bible say about these things? Does it say anything specifically about these things? Well, it doesn't have a specific command, but rather it provides guidelines which teach us and help us to decide where the lines should be drawn. So when it comes to eugenics, the, the, the issue is not if it can be done, but rather should it be done. Scientists are moving rapidly towards the time when they will succeed in cloning a human being and move on to experiment with all other you know, factors in the eugenics uh, process. But should they? That's the question. Should they do this? Should they continue this research? My answer is no, I don't believe so. You see, just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean you should do something. You know, I can, I can drive my car at 105, it'll go 105, 110, maybe 115. It can do that, but should I do that? And barely hang on to the thing at 50 miles an hour, let alone 100. <laughs> You know, they had the ability to build a great tower of Babel, but they should not have done so, and they were punished for it. So reasons why we shouldn't pursue this, biblical reasons. My reasons, they don't matter. That's a personal opinion. But biblical reasons why we shouldn't produce human cloning. Well, first of all, an act of idolatry. Human cloning assumes that man is in charge of himself and of his own destiny. It is the belief that we can improve on the human condition and the humaneness as it has been given by God. This is what humanity is like given by God. Well, we're going to improve humanity through science. Man is trying to take God's position in manipulating and ordering human existence. We shouldn't do it because it's also an act of disobedience. Man has no authority to cross over the line from manipulation of created things or animals to the level of human life. Who gave him that right? God permits man to subdue uh, to uh, manipulate uh, the creation, but he is not permitted uh, the same with life created in his image. He's not given human beings the right to play around with the life that he's created in his own image. Play around with a tomato, fine, you know, get, get a better yield out of your tomato or your, 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 or your wheat or, your, your sheep or your cat, your cat, fine. But there's no permission, uh, even implicitly uh, suggested that human beings can play around with human life made in the image of God. We are to love each other. We are to care for each other. And so medical procedures, transplants, all those type of things, those are okay because they pursue this end. However, cloning for whatever purpose is not supported by any biblical teaching directly or indirectly. Why shouldn't we produce it? Is there another reason? Yes, I believe it violates the one flesh principle in Genesis 2:24. There are two and they, and, and what did God do with uh, Adam and Eve? They became one, one flesh. That's a principle. Reproduction is the result of something specific. It's the result of the love and commitment of two individuals. Children are not lab experiments. They're not produced for a scientific or even a social reason. They are the byproduct of the love between a man and a woman. That's how God made it to be. The one flesh principle exists 
not only to guard you know, the, the essential nature of godly human relations, but also family and social structure as well as sexual union and also the spiritual and emotional uh, health of human beings. All of these things are based on the one flesh principle of marriage. Whenever we violate it in any way, the consequences are negative. Spiritually, it's sin. Physically, it can lead to all kinds of human problems. Another reason, quite practical reason, against cloning human beings, because many times it leads to abortion. Exodus 20, 13, thou shalt not kill. When humans are mass produced or produced as animals, the value of life decreases and it becomes easier and easier to dispose of faulty ones. You know, this life over here, you know, wow, this guy, whoa, he plays the violin, uh, he reads five languages, you know, uh, he does, he's good at sports, he's a wonderful speaker, he has a lot to offer, his life is rich, his life is full. The quality of his life is marvelous for this guy. Well, this little girl over here, she, she was born handicapped, she's blind, she can barely speak, her IQ is extremely low. You know, what can she do? What can she, what can she contribute? Think about the money it will cost the state to support this child with special needs and special classrooms and special teachers. All throughout her life, she'll need help. That costs money. Taxpayer money. Why not just you know, relieve society of the burden of all the care? She doesn't have a very good quality of life anyways. See how easy that just can roll off your tongue? Well, that's what eugenics leads to. The trading of human beings based only on what other people think uh, their value is. The command not to kill includes violating one's rights to freedom and life. When one is produced exclusively to profit another or for its body parts, we're guilty of destroying that person's life. You know, the total opposite of the command is to love as we love self. Producing lab babies is not uh, motivated by love in any way. As I said, just because we shouldn't doesn't mean we won't. And if it does happen, the question is, will it have a soul? Some people ask, you know, if you clone a baby, will it have a soul? Well, of course it'll have a soul. Of course it'll have a soul, it'll be human. What doctors are doing is not creating life, they're, mere, they're merely altering the way life is reproduced. God has embedded, imbued life with his image, with a human soul. All human life has this quality, whether that life is produced by fusing the sperm and the egg or tricking a human cell to reproduce itself. God is the one that's made human life in his image, not man. Man hasn't got the power to do such a thing. Scientists say that human clones will be genetically identical to their donors, but as fully adult, they will be different, just as identical twins uh, many times are uh, different. One thing is certain, Human clones will be fully human as such. Uh, they will require love as well as the gospel of salvation for their sins. However, human cloning is still prohibited by law. There's a law against it in the United States. In a moment of <laughs> sanity, 
God guided sanity when this became a huge issue several years ago, they passed a law saying, yeah, human cloning is not legal. You're not allowed to do that. Do you think everybody's obeying that law? Do you think there's not uh, some scientists somewhere in the world not trying to recreate human life? All right, the final two forms of human engineering are not as scientifically spectacular as cloning, but they represent man's attempt once again at controlling or modifying human life. So one is uh, pre, uh, there we go, prenatal manipulation, it's another type. This is a form of screening, but done when the woman actually is pregnant. The most common form of screening is done through a process known as amniocentesis. A needle is inserted through the abdominal wall and some amniotic fluid is removed from the woman for testing and for screening. And this fluid is treated and studied and from it doctors can determine if the baby will suffer from any number of uh, diseases. Once the diagnosis is complete and a disease or a malformation is detected, doctors may offer one of four options. A, allow the child to be born as is. B, abort the child. C, attempt genetic surgery as treatment. And D, use fetal blood transfusions as a way of treating that baby. Now this new technology enables parents to either treat unborn children who may suffer from disease or malfunctions or prepare themselves for children born handicapped in some way. Some parents will be in shock. You know, they get the report back from the doctor and the doctor says, well, you know, all in all, your, your baby is quite healthy and you know, blah, 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 except one thing, uh, he's blind and will always be blind. You know, something happened to his eyes. Many parents will be in shock to learn that, but usually once they get over the shock and the sorrow of that, they'll you know, bring it. You know, we'll, we'll, we're going to love that child. Unfortunately, a large number of people choose an easier route. And that easier route is the route of abortion in order to relieve themselves of that problem. We'll get rid of this one. We'll try again, see if we can get a, you know, a more functioning model later on. This is not the fault of this particular science but the science has led to more abortions because of the moral weakness of our society. And then you have postnatal manipulation. Many times the genetic screening is incorrect or parents without this information give birth to babies that have various handicaps. In cases like these, there have been situations where doctors have simply allowed the babies to die by withholding food or treatment. Can you imagine that? Defenders of this practice say that if an infant does not possess potential for human relationships, its life has no value. <laughs> Can I read that to you again? Defenders of this practice say that if an infant does not possess potential for human relationships, its life has no value. That's Richard McCormick, Kennedy Center for Bioethic Research. Sir Francis Crick, Nobel Prize winner said, no newborn infant should be declared human until it has passed certain tests regarding its genetic endowment. And if it fails these tests, it forfeits the right to live. These are the smart people talking. These are the smart people talking. The idea is that if a baby is too retarded or too mangled, it doesn't deserve to live. And the best thing for all concern is to allow it, is to, allow it to die or to kill it. It's, all, it's always amazing. <laughs> They never ask the parents of handicapped children what they think. 
their opinions never find their way into the final report of these people. And interview with people who have suffered with serious handicaps all throughout their lives. They don't ever get to be interviewed to find out, would you have rather have been aborted? Because when they do interview these people, the answer always comes back, no. I like my life. I realize I have limitations, but I, you know, I wouldn't trade my life. A very interesting point came out in one piece of research was that as far as measuring the capacity for satisfaction of life, people with handicaps have exactly the same amount of capacity to enjoy life as quote, people without handicaps. Of course, this type of thinking here, what I'm talking about, may please those who have to pay for care and relieve the family and society of a great burden. But once again, many compelling reasons, but not the right to do those things. Human beings do not have the right to knowingly and purposefully end the life of an innocent person. We know we've talked about, you know, the right the state has to maintain the law, to up, uphold the law and to punish criminals and the military to defend the country. Yeah, we've talked about that. But all things being equal, no human being, no quote doctor or specialist has the right to say that baby doesn't have a right to live. That baby who's alive and breathing now and who's looking for its mom, yeah, that baby, no. She doesn't have a right to live. Who are these people? Many times these decisions are motivated not by what is right, but by what is easy, what's cheap, what's faster, because we're selfish. So these two lessons have been an overview of this subject. I hope you've learned something and feel more comfortable in discussing issues that surround these things and issues from a, a biblical perspective. Why not cloning or why not do this? Well, you know, and isn't it amazing that so many of the answers are found in the book of Genesis, not in the New Testament, but in the book of Genesis. That idea of the one flesh principle is a very important idea. All right. Our uh, next and final uh, lesson in this uh, series uh, is going to be called uh, Prejudice in the Bible. I figured I'd finish with that one because prejudice, racism, you know, all that stuff is what gets so much attention these days. So I figured let's talk about prejudice in the Bible. What does the Bible say about that? And we'll talk about you know, critical race theory, all that kind of stuff. We'll do that next week to wrap up this happy-go-lucky, lightweight, entertaining series that we've done. All right, that's our lesson for tonight. Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it.